All right, looks like I'm next. Um, <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. So no presentation uh, on the PowerPoint side. I'm afraid you're going to have to listen to me. Um, <laughs> TechnoServe uh, that I've been working for for the last 11 years uh, is a nonprofit. Um, and like Grameen Foundation, a very business-oriented nonprofit. Our tagline is business solutions to poverty. Um, and so our goal uh, as an organization is to help enterprising people in the developing world uh, to get out of poverty by building businesses, getting jobs uh, in the private sector, uh, and creating market systems that are going to enable those outcomes to happen. So the work that we actually do uh, is uh, a combination of uh, often starting with uh, consulting type uh, engagements to look at market systems and look at the gaps and challenges in those systems. Um, very often in the agricultural work that we do, uh, which is the bulk of our work, uh, it's looking at value chains um, and looking at the gaps and challenges uh, as you go through the chain that impede small farmers from uh, being able to engage uh, in a market-oriented way, in a market-led way, uh, in those value chains. Um, and also why our private investors and local entrepreneurs not setting up businesses uh, in the middle part of those chains to buy stuff from the small farmers, process it, trade it, distribute it, export it, uh, and so on. And so the topic of this uh, panel is all about that part of it as far as I understand. It's uh, you know, what is the role of entrepreneurship uh, and building entrepreneurs and helping entrepreneurs build businesses uh, in helping to uh, stimulate these market systems uh, and get them to function effectively. And that's really at the heart of uh, the work that we do as an organization. Um, so some basic uh, numbers. Uh, we operate uh, with full country platforms in 23 countries across Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and India. Um, we have short-term engagements in about another 10 uh, countries. Um, and uh, we've been around doing this kind of work for 45 years. Uh, so we were probably one of the first nonprofits uh, set up globally to uh, do this kind of business stimulation work. Um, our latest uh, strategic plan, um, which if anybody's interested, I have copies of, um, uh, really focuses on how do we move beyond uh, just doing projects uh, to really promote system systemic change. Um, how do we take uh, projects to scale uh, so that we can create market systems that can reach hundreds of thousands and millions of farmers based on the lessons that we're learning uh, and others are learning in our space. Um, and so scaling is a really key uh, piece of it. Uh, another piece of our current strategic plan is really working at much more closely with the private sector uh, through a variety of corporate partnerships and public-private partnerships. So the first session that we had today uh, is an area that we're seeing increasing activity in. Um, and right now about 20% of our, about 50% of our funding overall comes from private sources. Um, just over half of that is from foundations like the Gates Foundation um, and, and, and Rockefeller, Ford, Kellogg, others. Um, and about just under half of it now comes from corporations uh, that want to create shared value, want to develop inclusive supply chains and inclusive business models and so on uh, in their work. Um, and this is the most rapidly growing piece of what we're doing right now. Um, let me um, give some examples uh, of our approaches um, where we're particularly focusing on that stimulation of local enterprise and local entrepreneurship in our work. Um, but before I do that, let me lead uh, with some questions um, that I was, as I was listening to the panels uh, earlier today, came up in my mind and then I hope that the examples I'll give will answer some of those questions. Um, so for me, uh, some of the questions I was sort of hearing from the panels earlier in the day were, first of all, where, do the, uh, where does the technology come from? Where do the business models come from? Where do the ideas come from that local entrepreneurs in developing countries can use to build these kinds of businesses that we're talking about that will create jobs, that will create market opportunities for small farmers and so on? Um, do they come from multinationals? Do they come from research organizations or uh, research departments at universities? Do they come from local entrepreneurs themselves? Uh, or do they come from entrepreneurs overseas, like Israeli entrepreneurs, for example, coming into the countries uh, in which we're working? 
Second set of questions then is, all right, once you've got those business ideas and you've got those business models and so on, and you want to land them in a particular economy, how do you test them? How does that get funded? Who are the investors? Uh, who's providing the credit and the capital? Um, and how do they go from testing to piloting to being fully established independent businesses that can then scale, be replicated, uh, and so on? And what's the role of a broader ecosystem of actors around those entrepreneurs in order to help those entrepreneurs be successful? The role of, uh, of NGOs, for example, the role of mentors, the role of the government. Um, a third set of questions then is, um, in particular, what is the interplay between international business and those local entrepreneurs? Can international multinationals or international investors, and again, I come back to Israeli entrepreneurs, for example, uh, be a stimulus uh, for local enterprise development, be partners, business partners for local entrepreneurs? And then fourth set of questions and final set of questions for me uh, that came up earlier is how do you provide the support to overcome the various barriers and challenges that those entrepreneurs are going to face as they're setting up those businesses without creating dependency? Um, because what we want to see is thriving market systems that are operating in uh, independently. I mean, we're a catalyst organization. We're an NGO, and we're an NGO because we can create public goods, but then we need to get out of the way and have those market systems and those businesses operating independently and autonomously. Um, so that was a set of questions that came to me, hopefully similar questions that you might have had. Um, some of the examples uh, that I'll just allude to briefly. One is um, the sort of value chain model, uh, which I think is sort of fairly well established. And one of the best examples of that that we've had where we've been crowding in local entrepreneurs is in cashew processing. Uh, cashew nuts in Africa have traditionally not been processed locally. They've traditionally been shipped off to India and processed in India. Um, and we developed a model to basically transfer the Indian technology into Africa and get local entrepreneurs to be able to set up cashew processing factories close to the production areas um, in order to add that value locally to create a more reliable market for local farmers so that they would actually invest more in their trees, plant more trees, husband those trees more carefully, increase the productivity of those trees, and get more value out of those trees. Um, so you get a double hit in terms of benefits from that kind of intervention. One, you're creating viable local enterprises, often in parts of the country where there's very few formal sector jobs. And these factories uh, can be employing many hundreds, if not thousands, of workers. They're large scale manual uh, processing facilities. Um, so the job creation benefits are quite substantial. Um, if you take out up the work we've done in Mozambique and the work we're doing in West Africa now, uh, I would say over the last decade, we've probably created in excess of 15,000 jobs in cashew processing factories across Africa. We haven't created those jobs. The entrepreneurs have created those jobs. We've helped them do that. Um, and then, of course, there's the market opportunities for the farmers. Another example um, is uh, around the food processing uh, industry. And this is a very active initiative that we have right now underway trying to transform uh, the food processing sector, which is a great stimulus for many different uh, crops. Um, it was started by uh, US, the US government's interest in making sure that people who are suffering from HIV AIDS have enough food uh, and nutritious food to be able to eat so they can take the medication to treat AIDS. Um, and so PEPFAR, uh, which is the organization within the US government that's really focused on that challenge, um, got into a discussion with General Mills about how could General Mills use its technical expertise to help entrepreneurs who are setting up food processing factories in Africa um, and businesses in Africa to build those businesses, uh, accessing you know very good quality technology, uh, good processing, good um, food safety practices, and so on uh, in, their, in their businesses. General Mills said, well, that's great. We can." We'd be very interested in doing that, but we don't have necessarily have all the expertise, so let's bring in some other private sector players as well. They brought in Cargill, they brought in DSM, uh, and most recently, Bula, um, <clears throat> and they formed an organization called Partners in Food Solutions, which now sends those kinds of technical skills, mostly through uh, Skype and phone calls, conference calls, and that sort of thing, using the internet, uh, rather than physically putting people on planes. Uh, sends their expertise to benefit those kinds of entrepreneurs. Um, we're on the ground as the partner finding the right entrepreneurs who want to participate in this scheme and then helping them with a range of, let's say, the more basic 
business building needs they might have in terms of basic business planning or marketing strategies and things like that. Uh, and so that partnership, which is again supported in that case uh, with various forms of granting from the US government, um, is, uh, has now reached about 500 food processing enterprises across five countries in East and Southern Africa. Um, and we're looking to expand that significantly. We think this kind of approach, it's, it's, it's proving to work very well, um, provides a lot of benefit to uh, those enterprises. The enterprises are growing faster, they're creating bigger markets, they're pulling more crops from small farmers. Uh, uh, the, they're reaching, those enterprises now combined are reaching about 600,000 farmers across those five countries. Um, now, many of those were already buying from those farmers. It's not that we've created markets for 600,000 new farmers, but, but certainly the markets are growing faster. Um, and I will just uh, give, what, let me give one more example, um, uh, and then I'll just move to quickly to see what I think are some of the key success factors of these kinds of uh, initiatives. Um, another example actually is uh, somewhat linked to the work Grameen does uh, more perhaps, but it's a partnership that we have with Vodafone, um, where Vodafone uh, and we, and again with US government support, and I know I keep mentioning the US government, we do work with other governments as well, although they're probably our biggest partner, um, have created something called the Connected Farmer Alliance. Uh, and this is running across Kenya, uh, Tanzania, and Mozambique. And in this particular case, uh, what we're doing in the first instance is uh, providing uh, supply chain solutions. Uh, Vodafone's providing the solutions. We're finding the businesses who want to use those solutions and then training them and their extension workers and uh, the communities who are receiving the benefits of the solutions. Um, and essentially it's creating mobile identities and then um, putting mobile payments in place. So that instead of uh, businesses that are sourcing from small farmers, whether it's an outgrow scheme or something less formal than that, uh, instead of them having to pay farmers by cash and only after delivery and so on, the whole thing can be automated using uh, links to mobile money, um, which significantly reduces the risk and increases the likelihood of participation and uh, the loyalty of farmers in those schemes and so on. Um, the second piece which is currently being developed is financial solutions um, on top of that. Um, so not just mobile payments but then also access to insurance products. And, um, in some ways this is in competition perhaps with <laughs> some of what Syngenta Foundation is doing although we've had discussions also about collaborating. Um, uh, but also um, mobile credit and other mobile financial services. Um, and then the third piece, which is where the local entrepreneurs come in, is that Vodafone as a mobile network operator doesn't want to provide every possible service that could be provided over its network. Uh, they want to use that platform to crowd in local entrepreneurs who want to set up value-added services. So things, for example, that could be storage uh, or logistics type uh, opportunities that could be facilitated using uh, mobile products and services um, that uh, Vodafone has no interest in providing themselves but that could be provided over their network. So they want to open, this is going to start probably next year, they want to open it up and run some kind of an accelerator type process to identify local entrepreneurs who want to set up those kinds of businesses. Um, and that actually could be something where there could be angles for Israeli entrepreneurs and so on as well if they wanted to partner with uh, local entrepreneurs in those countries uh, to offer, the, offer those kinds of services. So I hope I've given you just some examples of the kinds of interventions that we're supporting where we're really creating and relying on, frankly, the response from local entrepreneurs uh, for the success of these kinds of interventions. We're using uh, the subsidy that gets provided by a foundation or a public donor agency um, or even a government agency. We're working with ATA as well um, as a host country government agency and working with the South African government and a number of other governments in Africa, in uh, governments in Latin America uh, and India, um, to uh, catalyze the gap filling that's needed uh, in order to convince entrepreneurs that they can actually build these businesses successfully and make money out of them. Uh, and that the farmers can move from subsistence farming to being reliable commercial suppliers uh, who are also making money out of investing more in their farming businesses. So what are some of the key success factors briefly? Number one, uh, it's taking a systemic approach. Uh, it really is important to understand the complexity, and you've heard that from, I think, a number of panelists already today. These problems are not simple. The market is not solving it by itself because the problems are complex, and individual market players can't easily wrap their arms around the complexity and solve those 
problems on their own. So you need these kind of systemic interventions with multiple partners being crowded together uh, to, to solve them. But it's important to think, uh, and this is the second point, it's important to think about the sustainability of these interventions if you're thinking about it as a system and not as a development project. So we're trying to move away from doing projects uh, to really facilitating market system change. And that requires thinking about the institutional and organizational responses uh, to these kinds of interventions. What are the incentives for different players, including the government, uh, to play in this new way? And how do you push those incentives through whatever intervention you're designing in a way that's going to lead towards sustainability rather than towards everything falling down when the subsidy goes away. An important piece that is uh, a corollary then for that is um, that you need to be adaptive, that you're not going to get it right the first time. You have to accept that you're going to fail some of the times, and that's tricky in the donor-funded world, frankly, because especially for the public agencies like USAID or DFID or the Dutch government, uh, it's very difficult to explain to voters uh, why they might be investing in things that fail. Um, and yet, things fail all the time. Um, but we should be honest about that and learn from failure rather than trying to brush it under the carpet. In order to learn from failure, we need to have transparency. We need to have good measurement systems and good performance management systems. And we need to have those systems be things that are common across different interventions. So we can not just learn within interventions, but we can compare and contrast across interventions. And there's some interesting stuff, which I can talk about more if you're interested, that's going on in that area. Um, and then finally, I would say, on the policy side, we need, we need a level playing field. Um, that many of the host governments that we're working with uh, don't manage or govern this kind of world of development projects in food security and agriculture, or in other areas of their economy as well, very well. So you have some schemes where there's a lot of giveaways and a lot of freebies. You have others where people are trying to actually create viable market systems and encourage small farmers and entrepreneurs to pay for things. Um, and it's difficult for that second category to really thrive in an environment where you have the first category. Because especially while you're trying to build up the trust and the evidence base, people tend to opt for the, free <laughs> for the freebies and not want to pay for things. So uh, that's another critical piece. So thank you, and I'll pause. For, for